Oh, well, hello, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I am so psyched to share this. It's really more like a girlfriend jam than it is an interview with my friend, Jennifer Pasteloff, who wrote this amazing book that I just listened to the audio of. It's called On Being Human, a memoir of waking up, living real, and listening hard. And what I love so much about Jen's work is it's so real, and the memoir is about her life and what she experienced, but then all of these beautiful takeaways. So she spent years waitressing, 14 years waitressing, as she was progressively losing her hearing, so many different um, experiences that she's had. And what she, where she really shines is talking about shame and shame loss and how to not have shame, be the boss of you, and how to quiet your inner asshole, and a whole bunch of other things. So I hope that you get her book, On Being Human, a memoir of waking up, living real, and listening hard. I actually listened, just finished listening to the audio, and I loved it. And you can get it anywhere. It's sold Amazon and all the places. But I hope you enjoy this Girlfriend Jam with me and my friend, Jennifer Pasiloff. All right. I am so excited to welcome my friend Jennifer Pasloff to the Terry Cole Show. Welcome, Jenny P. Hi, thank you. So good to be here. So exciting. So there are so many things I want to talk about with this amazing book. I was just talking about it on the top when I was doing your intro, On Being Human, a memoir of waking up, living real, and listening hard. Now, this is available everywhere and anywhere, and I highly recommend everyone, you can press pause and go buy it right now. I loved the audio so much. And, it, you know, it's funny, Jennifer, we, we've been friends and we're newer friends in the last year. And I knew you, but then I listened to the audio book and I was like, oh my God, I want to talk <laughs> to her for 7,000 hours about everything because the book is such a beautiful um, combination of memoir, such honest sharing. And I love it because Jersey, and there were so many things that I felt so identified with the time frame, and, but also the, the life lessons mm -hmm. are so poignant and so universal. I was like, oh my gosh, yes. So I'm just going to, let's just, for those who, you know, we're not giving anything away for the book, but for those who are not familiar with your story, would you just start with telling us a bit about your story and how you sort of came to writing on being human? Yeah. Um, well, I always, I was always a writer, even from, you know, from very early childhood. Um, and I hid from that for a really long time, you know, when I was super depressed in my twenties. Um, but how I came to write it, I think is that I, I always, I was always going to, it just, it just came out on a different timeline. Um, I, I say the short script of it is it's a story of someone who wanted to die, but didn't, <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> I, you know, I had a, I had a very traumatic childhood, a, a very traumatic thing happened. My father, who was like my world, my best friend, um, we had a fight and he said I was being bad. And I said, I hate you. And that's the last thing I ever said. And, and he died and I was eight. My sister was five and you know, I was eight, so I thought it was my fault, yep. and that I was a bad person. And I and I shut down. I would not let myself feel. For if I did, I would never be able to stop feeling. And I also thought I didn't deserve to feel. And you know, bad people don't get to. And you know, all these uh, bullshit stories, as I like to call them. So mm -hmm. never dealt with that grief. And then. As I got a bit older, when I was a teenager, I discovered starving myself. And uh, that became a way for me to really, you know, as cliche as it sounds, have control and go, oh, I can, wow, I can really like, well, here's one thing I'm in control of. I'm not in control of anything except this. And right. I also, um, it felt like I, I can deal I can deal with life now. It just, it felt like a way that, I mean, I, I, it's all about control. Um, yeah. So hold, hold on for those who mm -hmm. don't know the story. So she's talking about um, developing a severe eating disorder, like yeah. super duper severe anorexia. I mean, it, it seemed like there were, there was 
binging and stuff in there too or was it mainly I just mean, I mean I still binge sometimes like you know I still tend to but I never threw up or anything like throwing up is like the worst thing for me I'm it's traumatic you know but right. yeah I, I would and I would oh I know I would over I would exercise like four hours a day so I was yep. like I'm an exercise bulimic you know I'm talking like to the point I have so many injuries now from those years it was just pounding my body pounding my body um and uh, that became the way that I, it became a survival tool for me. Yep. Ultimately, it was killing me. Yeah. And all the while I was losing my hearing and in denial about that and terrified about that and struggling with depression, which I had struggled with since even before my father died. And none of this was addressed or diagnosed or, you know, but starving myself worked and, and like being strong, quote unquote, and locking it all in. And, you know, eventually a lot of, a lot of things happen in the book, moving across coast a couple of times. And, but I end up at NYU and I'm a poet and three years in right before senior year, I, I have a nervous breakdown. Mm. My boyfriend breaks up with me and um, like my first love. And it was, basically me grieving for my father. I'd never dealt that, dealt with that. And I had a nervous breakdown and I had decided to take a semester off school. And um, I came to California where my mom had been and I got a summer job and I never went back. So that semester turned into forever. And the <laughs> summer job lasted, you know, almost 14 years. And, um, and I was miserable. I really was. And I and and yet I thought that's this is it though. Like I'm a bad person, and this is my lot in life. This is all I get. I didn't even allow myself to dream, you know, any different. Yep. It's it's so wild though because knowing you now and the work that you do now and you you do these on being human, um, really conferences and weekends all literally all over the world and there's thousands of people who you mm -hmm. have profoundly impacted. And so this, it's sort of like, there's something inherently incredibly hopeful about your story and what, what has come out of it for you. So let's talk a little bit about one of mm -hmm. my favorite things that have come out of it is something you say, which is how to quiet your inner asshole. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit bit about that yeah you know um i just i just recorded a podcast with my friend Catherine may wonderful author of wintering and we she asked the same question except she's british she said you're also um <laughs> i think you know everybody has one although look i'm not in everybody's brain but i'm guessing everybody has one and they, there are seasons of our lives decades sometimes days minutes where the inner asshole is running the show and um and that's the voice, like for me, that said, you're a bad person. That's the voice for me that said, um, you don't get to eat. That's the voice for me that said, you know, you're just a waitress and you're not a real writer and all these things. Um, so I think everyone, everyone has that, that voice. And if you don't, then call me and let's have coffee because I want to chat with you. The work is quieting it. I used to think it was killing it, but then I would think I killed it and it would be in bed with me again. So I go, hmm, I guess it's not about killing it. It's quieting it. And the epiphany that I had fairly recently was it's about offering it compassion and going, okay, I see you. I hear you. I get you. And not today, not today, Satan, because I ultimately, again, it might sound cliche, but I think the inner asshole thinks it's protecting us. Right. By saying like, whatever it is, ultimately, it thinks it's protecting us. I want to hope that. And so I offer compassion. I see you, I get you, and I don't need it anymore. And it's just about quieting it. It's not denying it. Okay, there's right. that silly voice again that is so detrimental. I hear you. And you know what? You're not the boss of me today. Right. It's also, you know, I, I how I sort of flipped it myself with the fear mind or the ego mind or the inner asshole or whatever you want to call it. It's like the Debbie Downer in your brain is really realizing that even though I resent it so much when it comes up, I also really realize that it's trying to quote unquote, keep me safe. Mm -hmm. Even though I know that means keeping my life super small and only doing things I know I'm masterful at and mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. stepping outside of the comfort zone, which becomes a friggin' prison. 
but it's almost like that that switch of the mind. And I agree with you. Bingo. I don't think that's right. Yeah, bingo. That's it. And it took me, it took me until my 40s to get that. And it's like it's been a really big shift. It's after compassion. And it's again, and it's like about it's not denying it. It's not denying my darkness. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons people listen to me, because Lord knows why else do they? But I <laughs> It's like, oh, I'm in it with you. Yeah, this is coming up for me. Let's go through this together. Instead of me going, well, back in the olden days when I used to have an inner asshole and, a, you know. Right. You're like, nope, still alive and kicking yes. right now. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Would you share a little bit? I find this that one part of your story that is so fascinating is you, even though devastating, is the progressive hearing loss. And how adaptive you were as a child. So would you tell us a little bit about how did that impact you and how is your hearing now? Well, it's funny you ask because I just, my hearing's terrible. Like without hearing aids, I can't hear. It sounds, I can hear a bit of sound. It sounds just like underwater or socks in mouths or, mm. or like you're down the street talking to me. Um, and I have tinnitus. I never do not have ringing and whooshing in my head. So I have hearing loss and tinnitus. But just like a couple of weeks ago, I partnered, I'd enter, I entered into a partnership with a hearing aid company and they work really well. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like a whole new world open up and it's very exciting. Um, awesome. I've always had tinnitus and, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to call it. I was ashamed because... When I was a child, I, when I was concentrating or reading or making art, I made this noise and I got made fun of for it. And as an adult, what I realized was I was mimicking the sound in my head. Right. But because I got made fun of it for it, I never talked about it or anything. And my hearing loss progressively got worse as I got older. I had chronic ear infections and I was warned, you know, the doctors warned to my mom, your daughter will have hearing loss, but it was never like, I don't remember it as a kid, but in hindsight, I do. I go, oh, oh, that's why I always felt on the outside. That's why I always got told I wasn't paying attention. That's why, you know, this, that, and the other thing. When I finally, like, okay, something's going on. I was in my early 20s in acting school, and I was terrified. And I still thought, if I don't say this out loud, it won't be a thing. If I ignore it, it'll <laughs> go away, you know. We know how yep. that goes. And I finally faced it. I finally let go of shame. I finally was like, okay. And now only if I could afford hearing aids. And I wrote a silly little blog about that, you know, maybe when I was like 34. And someone that took my yoga class read it and like right away and called and was like, what are you doing right now? I said, who is this? <laughs> She's like, go to this audiologist. They have a pair of hearing aids for you. And that began the journey. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, it was a lot of shame and, and it was progressive, you know, and it's, it's easy, I think, to be in denial. It's a lot easier to be in denial about something when it's progressive, when it's sudden. I mean, it is easy, right? If like you lose someone suddenly, you could be in denial because you're in shock. But if something's happening little by little, it's very easy to pretend it's not happening. Yep. Because you're also so adaptive that exactly. you're, you're, you are finding ways to read lips, to, to communicate however you can. Yep. But you know, Jen, it's, it's so interesting because you, when I first got turned on to your work and I saw how, how much you helped other people that you're always asking your community and giving us opportunities to be of service to folks who need help, like such, such the, the spirit of really in it togetherness, like not just mm -hmm. fake in it togetherness, but like actual <laughs> in it togetherness. Yeah, yeah. And I, when I was listening to the audio book, which I just loved so much, I felt like, cause I, I went away by myself for six days and five nights. And literally the only thing I did when I was there besides not socialize was listen to your, your uh, book. Means... And it it's was, me, I you know, it. I'm so yes. glad I did it. Oh, I don't think I would have felt the same way about it, honestly, Jen, if it hadn't been yeah. you, because I, it was funnier because it was you, it was more resonant because it was you. But when I heard about the person in your yoga class who got in touch with you and said, hey, there's a pair of you know um, hearing aids for you at this place, 
I was and like, I didn't oh. even know her name, Tara. I didn't even know her name. <laughs> and wait, this is the best part. She used to take my class. I used to teach at this studio in West Hollywood and it took me like an hour to get there. And you know, you're making $35 and she'd like read the paper. And, and I was like, she's grumpy. She doesn't like me. I had a whole story about her. <laughs> and I remember I was like, what? This is fascinating. This happens all the time, how we do that, right? Right. So this brings us back to though, well, two things. One I wanted to say, I saw this this beginning of this process of you always paying things forward. And I love that so much and how that really rubs up against people where they're like, why, why are you asking people to be helpful? Why are you bringing other people's pain into my awareness? Like, mm -hmm. I really want to live in my bubble, Jenny P. Can you please stop? <laughs> or you get on board and go, great. I can, I can help. I can do something to lessen the suffering of another, even if no one knows about it, even if I yep. don't know them. Yep. Right. Because then I, I know that I did that. And I mean, you know, it's the kindness of strangers that we remember in our own lives, like people who like this person who read the paper in your yoga class and what else but is somehow there? what else right. is there being a person like connection and like really you know i mean what's it all for maybe that sounds like i'm having a midlife crisis but like really <laughs> you know seriously yeah it's not we don't live in a vacuum and and i think back the irony that these people actually live around the corner for me in ohio now is so funny because you know i used to work in west hollywood and they used to always come in they were my regulars they had therapy upstairs this cute couple and uh one day 14 years ago m my nephew was just born and something was wrong with them and he was in NICU neonatal intensive care unit and my sister was in Atlanta and I couldn't get there and I was like you know my mascara was smudged I knew something was wrong and I told them uh and I went back to get their Arna Palmer's and I came back and they said we're flying you to Atlanta tomorrow yeah and and stuff like that you know um and and everybody has the capacity to to be of service i don't care how much money you have i don't care about any of that shit. everybody does oh yeah because the thing is listen it's not about money i mean those people gave you miles right like they they had... yeah i mean it, it can be about listening it can be about yes you know, showing up for someone in whatever way they need it. It can be about like offering a ride to someone. It could be about just like checking in. It, 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 I mean, there's so many ways. There are so many ways. Um, I wanted to sort of move into um, the, this, the whole process for you of starting this, um, these weekend things that you've been i forget why can't mm -hmm. i think of the name of what you call them what are they like retreat what are, retreat thank you my god did you ever have that where you're like what is that word yes 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 so what was the impetus for you to mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. and and what have you seen like what what has been the outcome for people because what you do my understanding is like it's this amalgamation is that a word like it's a combo of that's exactly what it is yoga but also um, lip syncing and dancing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Just joyful stuff, but a lot of real, honest sharing. And it seems well, like that is a really profound part of your weekends and the week long things that you do in Italy and France and all the stuff is, that you've been doing is. around the world. You know, I'm really proud of the fact that it doesn't fit inside a box because I hope that it inspires people, not, not that they want to do what I want to do necessarily, but that we get to create things and do things that like can't be labeled and named or, or categorized. And, you know, so let's say I'm in a workshop in London, which I'm very excited. I'm going back in February for the first time in two years. And it's like pack. Let's say there's 80 people. I don't like my workshops to be m m bigger than that because I want everyone to feel seen and heard and, you know, so yeah. it ends and everyone's like, I love that. And I go, but let's, let's be honest. If you had to describe it to someone, what would you say? And everyone's like, no idea. And yet, <laughs> and yet it's sold out. And I love that. Right. Right. It feels like, it feels like an F you to like everything, the publishing industry, just because everything's like, well, where do you fit in? What's your genre where, you know, and it's like, you yep. can't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
you know, it started with, I never wanted to be a yoga teacher and I'm really, really forthcoming with that. And then I went on, I was doing a lot of yoga and then I went on antidepressants and all of a sudden within like two weeks, you know, they kicked in and I thought maybe I will do a yoga teacher training. Like my friends all think I should simply because it'll be an escape route. Maybe, maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. from this restaurant. And it was, um, so I started teaching yoga and then I just started incorporating like reading poems, whether it's my own other people and incorporating my own personality. And then I started writing again. And that was the thing. I started writing again and writing these like, you know, personal essays, creative nonfiction essays, and people started reading them and kind of like following me, if you want to call it that, on social media. And, mm-hmm. and, and then I just, I got a bug up my ass and I went home to Philly. I went home to New Jersey and I was like, I'm going to do a workshop here. And I went to this studio in Philly called Diana Yoga and I had no idea what I was going to do. They were like, okay. And then I was like, oh shit, I got to figure out what it is, you know? Um, but I, I can't remember if I did the retreat before that. So we'll back up to, um, I did a yoga teacher training and I actually came on a yoga retreat here in Ojai with this yoga teacher who, his name won't be said, but he used to like smack women's asses in class. He used to always go to me, damn, look at that thing about my butt. And I would say, I almost just said his name and I would say, can you please stop doing that? You know, I, and back then I was like, <laughs> you know, but I was like, you know, I had an eating disorder and that's really triggering. and. Anyway, I came on his yoga retreat and I fell in love with this place. I fell in love with this place where I now live, where I now own a home. And I, I knew I came to that place in Ojai and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Then how I really got started though was, so I became a yoga teacher, mm-hmm. even though I didn't want to, right? <laughs> but I was like, okay, now I'm certified. And my wacky mom made me a website, taught herself how, I don't know how she's, you know, a weirdo mom. And <clears throat> My friend was a yoga teacher and she got hired by these life coaches to join them in Mexico. They're doing some retreat and they wanted her to teach yoga. And she was like, I'm moving to Austin. I can't, but my friend can. And I was like, oh my God, what? I just came out of yoga teacher training five minutes ago. But I remember I went and met them in the Valley and and like, you know, I was like, okay. And I, I remember I wrote about this in the book, but I felt like I just stole something. I was in the car and I was like, oh my God, I just pulled that off. So, and I think they were going to pay me like a grand, which was like more money than I made ever. And, and I went and I watched them and I didn't want to do exactly what they were doing, but I just, I had the deepest knowing, like I could do this. Mm. Um, so that's when I went to, when I went to Philly and I was like, I'm going to do a workshop and I had to figure out what it was, but basically, you know, very typical of me, I had no idea what I was doing and I made it up as I was going along, but <laughs> I took what I knew and what I was good at and what I was good at from, you know, gifts of birth, let's call it was like being with people. But what I had mastered all the years of waitressing was really like being with people and mm-hmm. with writing. And don't forget, I had acting experience and I, and, and humor and I had all these things and writing. And I was like, I just started putting them together. So in the beginning, it was just yoga, right? And it was like a tiny bit of writing, like on a sticky note, like, what do you want to manifest? Or what are you grateful for? And over time, I was like, I'm going to just be honest, this is never what I wanted to do. And it's still not. And I just started really owning what I wanted, which is connection. So yoga is a ruse. It's a trick to get people in the room, you Mm -hmm. know, and then, but then it does get people to open up because they're not as in their cerebral mind. But, but I made up this thing that ultimately it's getting people to connect. It's getting people to let go of the shame and to, to allow themselves to be vulnerable and to be seen and to, to connect. Yep. It's, it's so powerful. And I want, I want to, you, you just mentioned to release the shame and such an important part of the work that you do is you teach others how to get rid of shame, how to acknowledge, how to look at, how to understand. And from your memoir slash self-help book, I don't know what we're calling it. I guess it's a memoir, but it was filled with gems of wisdom. 
there was, you really grappled with shame in your mm-hmm. life. So can you just tell us a little bit about the trajectory of that Yeah, and yeah, what inspired you to do your shame loss um, series that you have? It's funny, I, when I gave a keynote, which you really helped me with, because I was deathly ill. So people listening, I mean, I was really, I was like, I thought I had COVID. I didn't. I was so sick. And I texted Terry and you, you gave me a mantra. I can't even remember, but I, I wrote it on a sticky note and I stuck it on my coffee. And um, when I was in Iowa, I gave this keynote and I said, you know, I said something like, I always thought I'd come to Iowa. I did when I was at NYU because there's a lot mm-hmm. of writing in Iowa and like, yep. you know, poets. And, and so I fancied myself when I was like 20, 21, you know, I'm going to end up in Iowa and I'm going to wear turtlenecks and be a poetry professor. And I was <laughs> saying this to them and I go, and I was going to keep writing poems about, and I pause and I thought like on stage, I was like thinking, you know, real time, I go probably about my dead father. Cause that's all I talk about. So, you know, I'm laughing cause it's like, okay, done. But <laughs> but it is true. I, I, so much of it comes back to that like primal, we want to call it wound or, or that really, yeah. that rupture, right? I, um, my dad was my person, dysfunctionally so, because it was very much like me and my dad and my mom and my sister. So it was like teams. Yeah. Um, in fact, right before my dad died, they were going to get divorced. And apparently my dad said, like, I'll take Jennifer, you take Rachel, because I guess he thought it was easier. I was older and my sister heard. And then my mm. sister, her narrative her whole life was like, why am I not wanted, right? Yep. So I said to my dad, um, he said, you're being bad and making me not feel good. And I said, I hate you. And he dies. That's the last thing. That's it. So in my head, I hear you're being bad. And like I say, I hate you. I killed him. It's my fault. I'm a bad person. Yep. I mean, that became my truth. I operated from that place. I also under hell or high water allowed myself to feel so like when people when they came to tell me your father died i said i don't care i mean that became my i don't care like clench my jaw you know i'm tough and it's the work of my life now every day to unclench and to soften Mm -hmm. and you know and i and i don't say that uh as a metaphor i mean like really like teeth breaking like i really it's a physiological response so the shame and i just buried it in my body i didn't talk about it because I was strong. And and then, you know, I I found the anorexia. And then then when I when I realized like when people started to say, like, you know, you have hearing loss, the shame and the denial and the defense, you know, and I thought I was broken. And I was a bad person. And then on top of it, I'm broken and and the fear and, you know, um and then, you know, like not like not ever finishing school and i and i really thought i was going to be this poet and this this in academia and i end up as like a waitress you know in west hollywood and Mm -hmm. just so not what i thought my life would look like and the shame i carried and and then i would lie you know like customers would come in and be like what are you up to and i'd be like well you know um (laughs) and that would cause me shame so it was just a non-stop spiral of shame yep and so, so how did you eventually get rid of it? Because you inspire lots of people now with mm-hmm, your, mm-hmm. instead of weight loss, you have shame loss. <laughs> yeah, which feels really empowering as someone who almost died from anorexia. You know, first of all, it gets really exhausting. It just does. Like it gets exhausting being a deaf person, small D deaf, trying to hear all the time. It gets exhausting, pretending, hiding. It's just like, it's exhausting. Mm. Um, I think that the, it's, it's not like a, just like one thing, one check mark. It's, it's a, it's a, um, ca- uh, a slew of things. So I went on antidepressants, right. Mm-hmm. And that allowed me to, um, then I became a yoga teacher. I got out of the restaurant. So little by little, I, I, I mean, I say antidepressants changed my life. Now, of course I changed my life. And they're not for everybody, but they really did. They allowed me to like, to mobilize. I was no yep. longer immobilized. Okay. Yep. So, so that, and then little by little, I began to like play around with like, just letting myself be me as, as I know that sounds silly. Cause it's like, well, who else would you be? But letting myself be me. And then, um, when I started teaching yoga and like reading my poems and doing my stuff and people started liking it, it's, uh, 
But then when I started writing and I started blogging at first, kind of corny blogs as a way to get people to come to my classes. But then when I thought, I want to write, I want to write poems. I want to write like I used to write. And I started like just, I don't know, I wrote like about depression and, and I was scared because I thought, oh, now I made a career out of teaching yoga or I'm trying to. And if I write about these things, I'm going to blow it. I'm going to blow it before I even start. What are you doing? And yet I did it anyway. And I was terrified. <laughs> and the opposite happened. So I think what I'm going to say is really important. People began to like come to me in droves and thank me and, and like the validation I got from sharing myself and sharing my truth. It kept me going. And the flip side of, the, of that is how dangerous that is. Because, you know, I, I'm really grateful back then, but, but now I have to be careful when that, that external validation is like, mm -hmm. yeah, keep going because someone's liking it. But, but back then it was like, wait a minute. Oh, they're not leaving me. They're not abandoning me because they think I'm a fraud because I take antidepressants and I'm a yoga teacher. They're right. thanking me because they were ashamed of their own depression. So it began because I, it, I began to, um, see the effect of how it was helping people as it was helping me simultaneously. I began, when I began to share, I was like, oh, I'm not as alone and weird as I think I am. Um, I also began to realize how easy it was. I was like, wait a minute, all I have to do is be myself? What the <laughs> fuck? This is a scam. This is a scam. If only everyone knew, right? You know? You're like, why did I make it so complicated for so uh, long? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, Jen, part of what I see and what I, from my experience of listening to uh, the book was it's like you started, once you were able to mobilize and put stuff out there into the world, the moment you started sharing your real self, as you're saying, and it started resonating with folks, it's like part of the shame was also shifting because you were living into a different potential, like you were doing something that's real, that was having a ripple effect that was impacting people and they were telling you it. So it's almost like you had to give up the idea of what that success was going to look like, the box, the pretty outside, the it's going to look like a turtleneck and go with, it's going to look like I got my own house in OI with my husband and my kid that I wasn't sure I was ever going to have. And like the life that you have now is obviously the life you're, you're meant to have. But I think that at least for me, your authentic vulnerability is disarming in one way, but it's so inviting. Why do you think that is? I'm, I mean, I'm fascinated by that because, because it is my way of being and I'm like, huh. It, Why is so it disarming? Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because we are, most of us, in the public eye or anywhere, anywhere, you don't have to be in the public eye. We have been erecting these false selves mm. and um, constructing things to protect our tender egos. Mm -hmm. And so being vulnerable in a real way. And again, like you said, you, you can be vulnerable in the moment of a rough day mm -hmm. where most of us aren't most of, and listen, it's different for me because I'm a psychotherapist. So there's a whole other layer of waiting until I'm th totally through something and have some gems to share with you. Like would you do that as well? But I think that you've really mastered the art of being human and celebrating all of the light and the dark in a way that I think so many people want, find enviable, but also it resonates it resonates as real. Like you're never, I, I don't feel like you're putting something on. And I think that why so many people responded to the book. And if you haven't gotten this book by Jennifer Pasiloff, I'm being human, go right now, Amazon. I really loved the audio. Sometimes I like to read a book, but I knew it was going to be a win. Yeah. I knew it was going to be driving. And I think the audio was really special. Me so too. listening too. to the audio book, is, it's just a gift. That that you can give uh, yourself. I, I want to speak to something though. That's really, I think you're going to understand because you're, I mean, you're my friend, you're my sister. You're also like a mentor and, and, and my like fake therapist and you know, all the things. <laughs> I mean, you are a real therapist. I'm saying you're my fake one. You're my friend, you know, but, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, you know, 
there's so many ironic things. I mean, I think about being human, but like the irony that I'm a deaf person, that I've made a career out of listening because that's ultimately what I do, tickles right. me to no end. It delights me. It 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 will never stop delighting me because right? Like who to thunk it and how beautiful yep. is that? Um the hardest thing for me bar none is to be vulnerable when my dad died like you if if I, if I could film that scene it would win an academy award in the kitchen and them saying and now my dad was my person mind you when they told me he died what I felt was I want to die and I was like I don't care and I locked everything inside of me like I I I just even whenever I like I'm about to feel or I'm upset there's something happens like I start to furrow my brow it's like a physiological response that mm -hmm. shuts down so the irony is that I am a master and I will say this with confidence I'm a master at holding space for others to be vulnerable mm -hmm. like nobody's business and I can share and and also I can share in a way there's still a remove with writing there's still a remove even with mm -hmm. like presenting that's not sure. the same thing as like just it's really hard for me to feel my feelings still, to be vulnerable. Yep. yep. And and I share that. And and I wish it wasn't so. And it makes it harder being on Prozac, but I also can't not be on it, not right now. So it, right. it's like, you know, it's unlearning. It's it's like letting my body um paying attention to my body, but I really uh I really, really struggle still with vulnerability. Yep. And I do too. You know. I, I think it's so common though, Jen, like in, in a real way, mm -hmm. because of training and a million things, your background, my background, everyone listening, everyone watching on YouTube, we all have our reasons to want to stay defended and to protect ourselves. Denial is such, you know, what do they say? Denial is not just a river in Egypt, because it is such a, a powerful psychological defense mechanism against pain. And, you know, in, in the book, you share a lot about how you denied things that were going on, like the hearing loss, like so many different things that it was going to get better or it wasn't that bad or, you know, next <laughs> yeah. week or tomorrow yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And how that really is what denial is, the, the fear of experiencing um, a reality that just seems too painful. It's just like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do if that's the reality. So I'm just going to deny it as you were saying, like, maybe it'll go away. But I think that what you're a beautiful example of is being in process. And all of us, if we're lucky, right, we continue evolving in this life. And I, I think that handling it, right, ha having the being human thing handled just means still doing it like we're alive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why it's funny because it's the second podcast. I haven't done a podcast in so long. And then, you know, I did too. And full disclosure, because Terry and I are really good friends and I think she knows me now. When you said, I'll see you in 10 minutes, I had forgotten. I didn't write <laughs> it down. And I was like, yeah, send the link again. So, but. I knew it. That's why I warned you. <laughs> I know. I know. I know it was either you or Catherine that like gave me like what, or maybe it was you I, where I said it was about someone who wanted to die and who didn't die. I'm still here. And it's, um, I, I, you know, I think being, it's so beautiful, right? Mary Oliver has this poem, the when death comes and the last line is one of my favorites. It's, um, it's gutting to me. It's, I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. And so what does that look like? What does it look like on a daily basis? And I think it's just like getting in it. And that means connection, right? What else is there? And that means all of it. And so, yeah, being human, you know, what else is there besides allowing for it all? Right. No, I love this so much. All right. I, I want to ask you one question before we're, before we're done, because there's so much more. But um, I ask this question to everyone. Personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it? Oh, gosh. I have a lot of boundary struggles and I get really <laughs> confronted by that word. You know, like I even hear boundary and I, I roll my eye. Like, I feel like it's like, it's a buzzword and it, it, it feels mean and bad. You know, I have to really unlearn everything. And you've taught me and your book has taught me so much about it. Let's see. The first thing that comes to my mind, I don't know if this is the biggest because there's a lot. Mm -hmm. is something I also just chatted with Catherine about because she asked me about my I got you tattoo and how do I navigate like what that means like for everyone and 
because I'm the I got you lady, it can be sometimes like a, almost like a manipulation where if someone, if I don't show up the way someone wants, it's like, but you're the I got you person. You're a fraud. You say I got you. It's like, but I can't be I got you to everyone. And that doesn't stop me from trying, right? So yeah. it's, it's, um, it's remembering that I got you looks really different all the time. And that sometimes being, being I got you means I have myself. And and I model that behavior. Sometimes it means like, you know what? You can read my book and that that's my gift to you. I can't yep. be everyone's best friend. I can't, you know, um, raise money for every single person. I get asked every day. And, yep. um, and it took a while to really like, to, because I know, I know what it feels like to hear no or be ignored or, you know, uh, radio silence and, um, and, and being okay, you know, being okay with, with like, Again, when I was in Iowa yeah. um, and I was sick, I was meant to go to New York and New Jersey after, and I was so sick. And I said, oh my God, I got to go home to California. And I was going to disappoint someone and I knew I was. And therefore I was like, no, power through, but I didn't. And I was really proud of myself because it's rare that I do that. So yeah. so I'd say the biggest boundary is, is, not, um, is my tendency to people, please. Yep. I so feel like that. Me. Yep. And it's a lifelong. Well, I so appreciate Jen, you sharing and spending so much time on us, but it, that I think for so many of us, if you were raised as a female, it's so much about unlearning what we learned and people pleasing. I don't know. I find it for me, it's a daily discipline, just like meditation, just like moving my body, just like all the things that I do to stay sane because of course we still want, we still really do want people to like us and think we're nice. You know what I mean? Of course we do. And why, <laughs> when, when people deny that, I'm like, man, come on, just tell the truth. It doesn't feel good right now. Fine. It cannot feel good. And then we can still be with it. Cause not everyone's going to yes. like us, but like, yep. come on, of course, you know, <laughs> I mean, unless um, you're like, you get off on negativity. Impossible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot boundaries. It, it's, you know, your book, your book's right here. And I, and I pick it up a lot. <laughs> and I, um, I didn't grow up with boundaries. And so it's, um, it's, it's interesting how even that word can be so triggering for me. Like, like, it's like feedback. I hear that. And I'm like, it's going to be bad. Right. <laughs> You're like, it's criticism, not feedback. <laughs> well, it, bingo, Terry. And so yep. even with boundaries, like my heart will be, you know, it's like, like I'm in trouble or I, I did something wrong or bad, and, yep. um, uh, you know, and it's like, wait a minute, it doesn't have to be, that's not, that's not true. That's my perception right. of it because I didn't grow up with them. And so they scare me and, yep. and, and maybe my experience with them had, you know, with people saying that have, have been such that I did feel like I was getting in trouble, you know? So I oh, yeah. associated with that. It's so true. All right. Tell us, tell everyone where they can find you. They can get the book everywhere, right? Yes. Yes. Everywhere. I like the paperback, the U S paperback because it, you know, it says national bestseller. And um, for some reason, Amazon sends the, the UK one, the UK cover. And my ego doesn't like that because it doesn't say national bestseller. So <laughs> hello. Um, you know, it's... you could find me, you could find me pretty much anywhere, but jenniferpasteloff.com, get my book. Um, as yep. far as social media, Instagram is where I live, Jen Pasteloff. And, you know, I coach, but not that frequently. So if we're a right fit, you reach out and I do, I do retreats and I do them virtually now every couple of months and it's magic on being human. So just Excellent. go to my site next one's in January, it starts January 23rd. And right it's on. the most magical, magical, magical thing. I would have never thought it could be possible. What's possible um, through technology Without and a doubt. shame loss, you know, the shame loss course. And I'm doing a writing class called allow in February that I'm really excited Excellent. about generative. So just jenniferpastloff.com, you find me and reach out, but mainly get the book and, and, and spread the word about, you know, being human. And yeah, let's all be human together. Shall we? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I love you. I love you. I appreciate you coming here. Thank you. It was fun.